I've got six o'clock. We'll go ahead and call the insurance committee meeting uh, to order. Uh, if you would, if you don't mind, look at the back of the minute, uh, the agenda and look over the minutes from the last meeting and then see if there's any corrections or additions need to be made. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Move to approve the minutes. And, uh, by Mr. Horace, second by Mr. Jewell to approve it. All in favor say aye. aye. Uh, Mary Ann's not going to be here tonight. She's our secretary, but she said she, well, she won't be able to watch it because it's not on. Are we live? Okay, okay. Mary Ann said she's going to take the minutes. Or she was sick, but she texted me and said she'd come here, but she'll be able to take the minute from watching it here. All righty. We'll move on to our uh, number three discussion. Uh, we got Wes Dozier here, I guess, to give us an insurance proposal. All right, hot mic. Um, so, uh, you know, as y'all know, I've uh, been here a couple of times, you know, first, first couple of times we were talking about insurance broker services and y'all were selecting a, a broker. Um, so uh, this time since then, uh, what we have done, uh, it's my understanding, of course, that the committee, um, after doing a, a survey and doing a study on compensation and benefits, uh, that y'all uh, wanted us to go out and look for uh, insurance plans that could uh, maybe be better than, than what you have right now. So I'll kind of walk you through uh, the process first, uh, and then we'll, we'll dig into the slides there. Um, so uh, when we shop a private insurance plan, uh, we go out to uh, the, uh, the, the big name carriers. So we go to Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Cigna, United, Humana, uh, Aetna, uh, several different uh, non-traditional carriers. So as a broker who works with uh, you know, almost 50 plus different insurance companies, we cast a really wide net um, and then we organize that information as it comes back in. Uh, so in the case of y'all, uh, you have to send a request in to, to get uh, what they call your claims experience. Uh, so that's the, the report that shows basically how many dollars have gone into the plan and how many dollars have been paid out of the plan. Uh, and that information uh, gets sent to the various insurance carriers that I just mentioned. Uh, from there, uh, we uh, ask them to shop several different plan designs and we get quotes back to compare those against what you, what you currently have. So whether you're already on a private plan, whether you're on uh, the state plan, uh, we compare those quotes back to what you currently have. So uh, that kind of talks through the process uh, a little bit. Um, through this process, uh, we had several of the carriers that um, just did what's called a decline to quote. Uh, that's when, uh, based on maybe geographical region or different factors that they don't think that they're going to be competitive. So rather than uh, giving a proposal, they just say, this is not a good fit for us, so we're going to decline to quote. Don't get your feelings hurt. Uh, like, yeah, they're, they're not picking on you. That's just kind of standard stuff. Yes, sir. Um, so you ask if the size plays into that? Uh, sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. Different carriers play better in, in different uh, spaces or different size groups. So it absolutely can. Yep. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, the quotes that came back in, the, the ones that was the most competitive uh, is uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and it was a high deductible health plan. Um, now, again, high deductible health plan, I think that scares some people uh, immediately. So I'm going to dig in and, and unpack uh, what that can be paired with to make the benefits comparable. And in most cases, I think better benefits with the state. Now, um, we were just talking real quick, walking up in the stairwell, um, and I'll repeat everything again, but um, insurance can be uh, kind of confusing. Um, 
And this that I'm going to talk about, it is definitely, uh, it's a different way uh, of doing it versus your traditional copay plan. So there's some really big benefits to it, but there's also, um, you know, a, a drawback in the fact that it is a little bit different than I think what a lot of people might be, might be used to. Um, following the bullet points here, just so I don't forget anything. Um, better, all, uh, better overall coverage, especially for family tiers. Uh, and I'll back all these uh, bullet points up with the data. Uh, lower medical out-of-pocket costs for employees and their families. Uh, I believe that there's definitely some premium advantages, uh, especially for uh, the family tiers. Uh, the pricing is going to be very competitive uh, fr fr from the employer standpoint as well. Uh, and this option actually makes the insurance a lot more simple to understand. Instead of having multiple different options, uh, it is just one single plan offering with four tiers, just like the four tiers that we have today. And when you're on a private plan, uh, I believe that there's some intangibles when it comes to uh, service, um, the, the service from your, your broker and from the insurance carriers when you're on a private plan. Uh, the, since the last time I was here as well, the state has released their 2023 insurance rates and uh, they released an aggregate. Uh, the aggregate, um, I don't want to put words in their mouth. I forgot exactly what it was. But when they say aggregate, it's not just a blanket increase across the whole plan. Every single plan offering, whether that's the individual coverage, the, the family coverage, whether it's partnership, whether it's premier, you know, y'all have four different plan offerings and each one of those plans has four different tiers. On top of that, there's two different, basically two different types of networks that you can pick from. So there's a lot of different tiers. So the increases are different based on tier based based on plan based on network uh, i'll get into a slide here in a minute but basically what it comes out to be is based on your um, plan participation uh, there's about a 10 percent increase on the state health plan uh, also they are the the state health plan that is has increasing out-of-pocket maximums uh, this year uh, from from what they've said they've got some other costs that are uh, that the that are going up on the members, such as uh, copays, uh, you know, potentially some of the prescriptions. So not only is the cost going up, but the coverage, uh, some of the risk is also being transferred to the employees. So I'll I'll pause there. Again, I know medical is like a, a lot of information coming at you at once. Any questions so far? Okay, uh, if you look at some of the information here on slide number three. Uh, this was an expected increase, um, and it's expected um, uh, for the, at least this year, possibly even uh, the following year. The next slide is where the, the rubber really starts to hit the road. Uh, slide four and slide five. Um, slide four and slide five, the top three options are exactly the same. The reason that I uh, trimmed down option number four is I wanted to uh, have a more simplified view to start. And then I can under, unpack what age, uh, what page five uh, is, why there's three additional options that are on there. So the first row that you see here is the, is the 2022 state plan LG1. So that is the plan that you're on right now. And again, based on the uh, number of people that are participating in the different plans and different tiers, the, uh, the total cost is right at 843000 um, 612 total cost. Uh, as you look over to the right, the portion of, co of cost that is on the employee is right at $160,000. And the employer portion of that, what Trousdale County is paying is uh, right at $682,000. So that's the baseline right there. That's what we're currently doing today. These other two options are assuming uh, that the same number of uh, participants stay on the plan. Uh, so just trying to keep everything apples to apples as possible. So uh, the 2023, so the rate increase to the state, uh, same participation, the total cost to go up to about $932,000. Uh, 
Of that, the employees will be paying 176,000. Trialsdale County uh, will be paying 755,000 and some change. And that's where uh, it represents for y'all, uh, for the employees and the employer, uh, both of those are about a 10% increase from, from your current costs. The last option here, uh, this is the uh, 2022 Blue Cross and Blue Shield HRA. Um, the, uh, the health insurance plan is 625,000 itself. But uh, if y'all know anything about a high deductible health plan, there's no coverage until you meet your entire deductible. So the member pays the entire cost until the deductible is met. So that by itself would not be a welcome change from the employees. We would not move people from a copay plan to a high deductible health plan without some type of assistance. And that assistance comes in the form of what they call an HRA. Is anybody familiar with what an HRA is or HSA, have you heard of it before? So the, the HRA is a health reimbursement arrangement. So basically that is, um, it's owned by the county. Those funds are owned by the county. And if the employee needs those funds, there is an available bucket of money for the employee to pull from, okay? So I'll dig into the details when we get into the plan comparisons. But basically uh, the HRA, you factor that in there, the employee portion of this, this is where I talk about it lowering the cost for the employees. By, by moving to the Blue Cross and the HRA option, the employee's portion of the premiums goes down from 160,000 down to 113,000. So there's a lot of employees that would be saving money with this plan. Uh, the, uh, the employer portion, uh, if you look over third or fourth from the right, the expected spend for the county government would be about 717,000 total. So it's an increase over where you are today, but it is less than where you will be if we just stay with the state for, for 2023. And we can come back and revisit this slide. Um, I think that uh, as I go through the other slides and, and really dig in and show you numbers about the differences in the plan, then we can come back and look at the budget slide again. So I'll pause and see if there's any questions at the moment. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, go straight over to, uh, to slide number seven. Here you're going to see four different plan options. The first one that you have is in the far left-hand column is the state premier plan. The second one is the standard plan. And the third one is the limited. Uh, the state also offers a high deductible health plan currently, but nobody participates. So I left that one off. But y'all do have employees that are in the premier standard and limited. Uh, as you look at the benefits here, the deductible is the first four rows. And you'll see here, the deductible is if it's not a copay, if it's not um, you know, just something simple like going and getting a prescription, uh, the deductible means that the member is responsible for this cost until they've satisfied their deductible. So if you go into the hospital, if you have a surgery, the deductible portion up at the top here is saying, this is how much the employee has to pay out of their own pocket. So on the premier plan, it's a $500 deductible. Then the insurance starts paying 90% and the member pays 10%. They do that all the way until the maximum out of pocket of $3,600. That's down there, what appears to be about the, go down to the very bottom. So the premier plan, even though it's considered to be the richest plan, the employee themselves, if they reach their out of pocket maximum, has a $3,600 out of pocket cost in addition to how much they're paying for their insurance premiums. 
And then as you stair step up from employee only to employee child, employee spouse, and, and then family, you can see that the out-of-pocket costs go up as you add more people to the plan. The standard plan in the middle, the deductible gets higher. So instead of a $500 deductible, now the member has to meet a $1,000 deductible. The insurance pays 80-20. And then again, down here at the bottom, there's a uh, $4,000, $6,000, $8,000, and $10,000 out-of-pocket maximum uh, that the member would pay in addition to their premiums. And then on this, the, the limited plan, you can see that the deductibles are even higher, starting at $1,800. And then when you come down and look at the out-of-pocket that the member might experience, it's $6,800 out-of-pocket for the member. Anything above employee only is $13,600 out of pocket. And again, that's in addition to the monthly cost of the insurance. The HRA uh, that I'm talking about that I think is the competitive against the state, um, it is that high deductible health plan. You see that there's a $6,000 deductible or a $12,000 deductible, but where it, where it makes sense is you come down here and you look at the HRA contribution. There's basically a bucket of money for each tier of coverage that the employee has access to when they go and seek medical care. So the resulting out-of-pocket maximum is 2,600. That's if somebody maxed it out. So an employee only, they could have a heart attack. They could be going through cancer treatment. The maximum out-of-pocket that they would pay with this plan is $2,600 per year. Uh, for individual, 4,400 for employee child, 6,200 for employee spouse, and 8,000 for family. Now, again, I, I wanna pause here, and I want y'all to look at the bottom four lines. Even on the plan that is considered to be the richest plan, the out-of-pocket maximums are 36, 54, 72, and nine. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield with the HRA, we have beat the out-of-pocket maximum by $1,000 for every single one of these tiers. So definitely lower out-of-pocket cost for the member. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, you can skip the what is an HRA. Uh, I already talked about that a little bit. Slide number 10 is just another way to show you how you get to that um, that out-of-pocket cost. Um, then let's look at the insurance premiums. Go to slide number 13. So the, the way that I modeled this is I did add a cost of $20 for employee-only coverage that the member would have to pay. I can lower this back down to zero, but just for the purpose of showing y'all um, a, a recommendation, if you will, when, when you offer free insurance, it doesn't matter if the employee needs it or not, they're going to take it. But why would you, even if you have coverage somewhere else, if it's free, they're going to take it. Uh, everywhere that I've ever done this, when you offer uh, coverage at no cost, there's always, we always find that there's people that are double covered and they're taking the insurance just because it's offered for free. Um, what that does to your budget is it drives up how much the county is spending. So even if you introduce something as small as $10 a month or $20 per month, the people that have health insurance somewhere else or through a spouse already, you actually see some of those people get off of the plan and it ends up saving the county money. Now, again, I threw that in here, um, just because I can lower this back down to zero if you want me to. So currently, if you look at the first column, um, you notice how I put employee, do y'all see where it says uh, 20 in parentheses, and one, one, and zero? That is the number of people that are participating in each one of these plans. So even though the state offers four different options, Trousdale County only has three different um, 
three different options that are being utilized. So people are in the premier, the standard, and limited. Uh, there's 20 people in employee only premier, and then uh, one in employee child and one in employee spouse. You look at the standard, there's, there's five, and then there's one. And then there's 65 people that are in employee only on the limited, and that's because it's the no cost option. So if you're looking at the numbers and you wanna know how they break out, 38 people are participating in something other than the employee only limited and 65 are participating in the limited plan. For those 20 people that are in the premier plan today, their current cost is $216 a month. Their monthly cost would go down to $20. That would literally save them $196 per month and over uh, close to, well, not to overstate it, over $2,300 per year. So that's like giving 20 people a $2,300 raise. Um, the, the other two people that are participating, you got one, like I said, employee spouse and one employee children. You see the difference in cost right there. Uh, one of them would be saving 4200 and some change, and the one with employee plus spouse would, uh, would literally be saving over $6,000 per year, okay? W when you're going down from three plans to, to just one, as, I've, uh, as I have it proposed here, you have to match the benefits of the richest plan, but you have to compete with the cost of the lowest plan. So the standard plan is the one that falls in the middle. And again, there's not a ton of people, but for those five people that are employee only, um, it's $143 a month in savings. Um, employee child coverage, uh, that person would save over $3,000 per year. Uh, then you get down to the limited plan. The limited plan has 65 people on it. Um, I modeled that as a $20 uh, per month. So that is more than what they're paying today. But you'll notice literally on this entire chart, that is the only, um, that is the only plan where we've modeled an increase uh, of $20. It, it wouldn't move the needle that much though, if we wanted to lower that back down to zero. I just think that there's some folks that have the plan that probably have coverage somewhere else. And you know, when you're looking at an insurance plan that costs $500, $600 per month, you know, you have two or three people that are taking it just cause even when they don't need it. And that drives up the county budget. So I'm just looking for ways to pinch a penny. Um, but you have four people that have employee children coverage, two with employee spouse, and then four with uh, family. And you can see there the savings for them is not as large. But when you look at the coverage, the out-of-pocket cost to the people that have the limited is far, far less than, um, than the plan that they have today. All right, uh, the next slide, uh, slide number 15, uh, for those of you who like a, uh, a bar graph, um, basically this is showing the four different options that are out there, the three that you're currently having today and the, the new Blue Cross HRA uh, as proposed. And basically across the bottom, it's going through zero claims, low claims, medium claims, and high claims. You see there that the green bar is just slightly past the red bar. That's because I modeled it with a $20 per month cost. So somebody with no claims would obviously pay a little bit more. But as soon as you get into the low claims, medium claims and high claims, this is a way to just show you visually how much less out of pocket the member would have versus the other options that are out there. All right, and the next one's where the rubber meets the road, right? Like I've, I've been talking a bunch of numbers, I've been talking deductible, coinsurance, and you know, people's heads start to, to spin when you get into that stuff. Uh, what we've done here is we've got some, uh, some scenarios. So these scenarios take the, the three options that you have today, 
and that's in you know same format. The, the first, second, and third rows have the premier, the standard, and the limited. And then the last one is the Blue Cross HRA uh, with the HRA that we're talking about. Um, you'll notice across the top of the average Joe that every single claim is an eight hundred and forty dollar claim. So what this chart is doing is it's showing you how in this vacuum this claim would be paid out. And then down at the bottom, it's taking the cost of the insurance plus the cost of the claim and adding those together. See, because a lot of times people, they look at what the monthly cost is over here in one silo, and then they look at how much are my claims gonna be in a different silo. At the end of the day, that's all of that together is your cost of insurance. Even if you never use your plan, you're going to pay a set amount of money per month. Then if you use it, you're going to have a cost. So what I'm saying is we shouldn't be looking at those in two different silos. It's all money spent on healthcare. So when you add that together, that is what the bottom section is here. It's what is the cost to the member for the claim plus the monthly cost that I'm gonna pay whether I use my insurance or not. So average Joe is the one uh, that, um, that it's the closest and it is the only one where the current state limited plan is, uh, is better than um, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield HRA. But again, the only reason that it's better is because I modeled it with a $20 cost, okay? if I if I took it back down to zero, then the Blue Cross and Blue Shield HRA um, in this scenario would come out better. But if you look at the employee, the employee child, the employee spouse and the family, and you compare some of these costs, like real costs to the member, you see where I believe this coverage is comparable, um, comparable if not better than the state in most of the instances. And that one where it's not is on the employee only coverage, um, which I could take the premium down to zero and, and it actually would be. The next one is the average Jones family. Um, when you look at the cost here, again, you'll, you'll notice and you'll see which plan has the lowest out-of-pocket cost. Same thing on the next one. Just looking at different scenarios, managing diabetes. So for somebody who is actually managing, um, you know, a chronic condition, you know, such as diabetes or, you know, wh wh whatever that is, uh, it can be a number of different things. They go to the doctor several times per year. They have prescriptions. You know, they're a regular user of their insurance. You can see here when you're comparing the out-of-pocket cost of the uh, the the, again, the cost of the claims plus the cost of the insurance, you'll see that the numbers on the Blue Cross um, and Blue Shield plus the HRA are, are the lowest out-of-pocket cost. Uh, outpatient knee surgery. Uh, this is another one. This will be having a baby, knee surgery, you know, something that's a, um, a little bit larger claim but not devastating. And again, you look at the difference in what the member is paying out-of-pocket, and I think that it's um, a pretty significant savings there. And then the last one that we have, uh, this is if more than one person were to max out their claim. So let's say we had two people that were in a car accident and their claims, they both hit the maximum. Look at the out-of-pocket costs on that versus all the other options that are there. So again, um, lower out-of-pocket costs to, to the member. Um, the way that I've got it modeled out, and again, how we get there is that um, the, the member would have a $250 deductible uh, that they would have to meet. And then after the $250 deductible is there, then that bucket of HRA money kicks in and the member pays 10%. Um, the insurance pays 90% until that bucket of money is, uh, is exhausted. All right. Um, I'll stop again and see what, uh, what questions y'all have or feedback, just general feedback on, um, on what you've heard so far. 
good, bad, ugly. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You've talked a lot about the bucket of money. Uh, give me a rundown again, how that bucket gets filled up with the money. Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, the money that's there, uh, go back to, go back to slide, slide number 10. So the medical insurance plan itself is that first column. It's a $6,000 individual deductible or a $12,000 family deductible, anything above employee only. So if you just had the insurance by itself, the member would pay 100% of the cost until you reached either six or $12,000. And then the insurance would pick up everything after that. No, no limit. What the HRA does is every single person that participates has that amount of money available to them right there. So the, th the employee only that has a $6,000 deductible, that employee has an HRA bucket of $3,400. And that's how you get to the most that they would spend out of pocket is 2,600. So what happens is the member, it's, uh, the HRA is integrated with the Blue Cross and Blue Shield medical card. So when that member goes to the pharmacy, when they go to the hospital, they go to the doctor, that bucket of money is available to them as a part of their insurance. It's integrated. So they go to the doctor. Let's say that there's um, you know, a, a $1,000 cost. The HRA money gets taken directly from the card at the point of service. Um, then the money gets um, swept out of Trousdale County's account to replenish the money that went out to, to pay the providers. So Trousdale County never lets go of that money unless the member actually has to use it. So the HRA funds are always owned by the employer. So if the employee does not use the HRA funds by the end of the year, that's not money that's gone out the door. That's money that never even left Trousdale County. Okay. The, the, the money act never leaves Trousdale County's bank account unless the member has a claim and uses it. So I, I call it a bucket of money. It, you're not walking around at the beginning of the year and filling up everybody's bucket. That's just the amount of money that they have available to them. So from a cash flow perspective, it can help out the county that the HRA funds, they don't leave the county's bank account unless the member actually incurs an expense. So Crowley County is putting those funds? Yes, sir. Correct. In lieu of their premium? Uh, because the premium is so much lower. So if we take the lower premium, starting what they've been paying, then that difference is what goes into so, no, 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 no. Yep. Yeah. Correct. So if. Yes.
So You're you're actually correct. So the the 918 that you're talking about right there, that is if every single person that had coverage uses a hundred percent of the money in their bucket, and that is a statistical. It, it's impossible when you look at the actuarial tables of, of how much money is spent. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you can talk with all the insurance carriers. Um, the standard is that there's about 50% of the available funds that are in the HRA actually get spent by the members. So again, going back to the slide number four, the cost of the insurance is 625,000 versus 932,000, right? So the difference in that, that is where you're seeing the savings to be able to fund the HRA. So you're earmarking that money for the HRA that you know, you're, you're estimating how much money you think you're gonna spend from a budget perspective and you're putting that money into the HRA. And it only leaves the county's account if the member incurs the expense. So if, if you're walking from left to right on the slide number four here, the cost of the medical plan, 625,000. If every single person maxed out their HRA, then that would be 407,180. Every, every plan, every person use the maximum amount in the bucket. So when you add both of those together, that's 1,032,271. Now, if, that, if you stopped right there, then why in the world would you do that? Why in the world would we pay $100,000 more? And the reason is it is impossible for every single member to max out the out-of-pocket. The estimate that we're using, well, let me keep on walking across. Um, if it was a 1.2 or 1.03 million, of course, that would be a 22% increase. That would be a lot. The next column says, how much are the members going to pay? So today, the members are paying 160000 If we stay on the state plan, the members themselves are going to proportionately split the cost, and they're going to bear $176,000 of the cost. With this option here, the members will bear 113,400. So if you, you remember that slide where we looked at every single person's premium, how many people are participating in each plan, based on the number of people you have that are saving, uh, remember that premier plan where people are saving, what was it $260 a month? There's more people that'll be saving money than, than paying more for the employee only coverage. So the member's share of the cost goes down to 113,000. So we are basically saving our members $47,000 in monthly premium costs. Uh, I mean, y'all only have, let's call it a hundred people on the, on the, 103, $20, $200 or $240 times 103. So 24,700. So if we were to take the cost back down to, uh, to zero, that would shift the numbers. That would add an additional 24,700 um, in savings back to the members. So the employees cost would be well under 100,000 and it would shift 
the 24,000 uh, into the uh, column that's fourth from the right, employer after HRA spend. We're just sticking, we're just sticking with your math. Mm -hmm. Correct. Then it comes to the seven hundred seventeen thousand dollars. Oh. Oh. Then it comes to the seven hundred seventeen thousand dollars instead of the nine hundred eighteen. That is correct. Right. Which, if you keep going over, we we would the, the county would incur a cost of thir almost thirty five thousand dollars versus seventy two if we stick with the state plan. Is that? what I'm reading, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Which is the difference in the 5% charge or 5% cost versus the 10.6. Yep. Now, remember here too, that the comparisons that I put in here of just the coverage about the out-of-pocket cost, I'm showing you the 2022 state benefits. The state is increasing their out-of-pocket maximums they're increasing some of their co-pays. They're shifting more cost onto the members in addition to the increase. The only reason that I don't have the 2023 actual benefits in here is because they said that they're not releasing what's changing until the open enrollment material comes out, which is usually not in September. So as you're viewing it today, um, the numbers actually get better on the employees because I'm still showing you the 2022 state plan before they increase on those out-of-pocket maximums. Yeah, and this is what I was saying earlier. I don't, um, I admit and I acknowledge that this is wildly different for here, but this is a widely accepted plan that county governments across the state of Tennessee have. Um, if we did something like this, it would take um, education. You know, we would come out and I wouldn't be getting into as much of the budget details and, and those types of things. We would be walking members through, this is what you have today. This is what you would be moving to. And this is what that means to you. So again, regardless of what we do with the premiums, um, if we were to lower the limited plan back down to zero, worst case scenario is that we would be telling employees, your monthly cost stayed the same, but your out-of-pocket exposure went significantly down, right? That's for the people who have the limited plan, employee only. Every single other person we met with, we would be telling them, your monthly premium has gone down significantly and your coverage has gotten better. So let me walk you through your plan and what that means to you. Yeah. So, so basically we're self-insuring for a portion of the deductible. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. That, and that's... from my biggest question and did the mayor- He's here. Okay is from a budgetary standpoint, how, how do we budget for this? I so, mean, it's one thing to budget for a set premium amount that we know we're paying. Uh, with this, are we gonna budget for the 100%? Are we gonna budget for this 50%? Or are we gonna budget it at 60% uh, to, to have the money available uh, and to not get in trouble with the comptroller's office or anything. So I guess uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a way to do it. I'm not saying it can't be done. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm failing to understand exactly how. Uh, I do understand the savings. I do understand what we're trying to do. And instead of us giving the 50% that's not used, we get to keep it basically. 
Yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Wow. It, and that's what the next slide is, um, I, the slide number five. But it, Mayor, I mean, from, from a budgetary stand, how would we, how would we budget this amount uh, to go forward? Since this is this is subject to being whatever people need or have to use out of this pool of money, uh, what happens if we don't budget enough and then all of a sudden somebody needs it and it's not there? Are we going to have to do you know mid-year budget amendments to try to beef up the insurance pool or? And the money that's left over, will it carry forward year after year after year, or will it just roll back into the budget? You know, I'll, I mean, we're, you know, that's the kind of questions, I guess. As far as the percentage, what you would budget on, that's going to be something we look at. I know they're saying if you look at it, you typically don't see above 50%, and that's where they're coming over with 717. I think in talking to some of the other counties, initially they budget a little bit higher than that maybe 60%, and then they see how that works out. You can do a mid-year budget amendment. We kind of do those right now with the insurance premiums. But like the ones I've talked to, they kind of budget over the first year and see how it works out and then adjust after that. And my understanding, what you don't is you want you don't spend, it rolls over in your budget every year. Yeah, uh, he nailed it as well right there. And that that's what that next... Uh, budget slide is with the additional three options well i, I think was, the, the main reason i'm asking that yeah you know we're looking here and the other commissioners you know they're going to look at at our our total cost of what we're paying now what we're proposed to play for the state plan and uh, even in 2023 figures that we have here and then you look at what our total cost is going to jump from 756,000 or whatever it was to a million 32 or 918, I don't know, whichever. Um, it's a big increase. And I, and I know we're banking on that not having to spend all of that increase. But I guess my question was, are we gonna have to budget for that additional, because that's a huge jump from what we're paying to what we would be paying. Uh, correct. And typically what we see other counties that do this is um, what Mayor Chambers was saying. I've never seen anybody budget 100% of the spend because, again, it is 100% is literally a statistical improbability. Um, there are counties that, uh, that are on this plan uh, that after they've been doing it for a few years, they they just budget in the 50 and again i don't want y'all i'm i agree with what you're saying is you got to budget something and you don't want to underfund it because then you just have to come back and do a budget amendment so even at the 60 percent funding level which is the second from the bottom over here that pretty much puts you dead even with where you're at right now and I'll go back to the, a lot of people come in, um, insurance brokers, and they make big promises and say, I'm going to get you better benefits and I'm going to save you a bunch of money. Okay. Well, sometimes that happens, but a lot of times it is in reality, it's I'm going to bring in a plan that is comparable and with better benefits. It's comparable from a budget standpoint. But overall, it's better for the members themselves. And I think that's what I'm saying here is. Um, I think obviously this is. I think you've illustrated that very well, that uh, the employee is going to be the biggest beneficiary of this. And I think we, we want better for our employees. I think we all want that. Uh, but not at the point of breaking the bank. And I, I think... I think that I see that this is very doable. I just didn't understand, I guess, the, uh, the inner workings of it is the, how it would all play out in our budget scenarios. But certainly if we can get by, it, you know, if that's allowable to fund it at 60%, 
and we're not going to have the comptroller's office questioning us why we didn't fund it at 100 percent and all those type things that we have to look at and answer to uh that you know uh, come into play on some of these decisions uh it i appreciate all the work you put into it and it looks at least at first glance introduction tonight that it's a certainly a win for the employees and a break even for us and possibly a win for us into the future and you know not immediately but after a couple of years it, it absolutely would be or should be yeah and, i agree and i agree with everything you just said I got a question on, I know you said typically you don't see more than 50%. What's kind of a level or percentage you see, if, let's say the, the county for some reason has a really bad year as far as employee claims and that kind of stuff. What do you typically see on those, those we'll just call them a bad year. So typically in a bad year, um, when you're talking about health insurance, the number of people that drive a bad year are typically a very, very small number of people that have bad claims, like an ongoing cancer claim, massive heart attack. You know, like when you're looking at the plan, a bad year is typically going to be, you know, less than 5% of your population is driving the majority of the cost. Because of that, it's hard to have these huge spikes and say that this is a really bad year because you're spreading this, the self-insurance part of it is only on the front end. It's only on the first 6,000 or the first 12,000 because after that, insurance kicks in and pays 100%. So the majority of the risk is on, is on the insurance company. Uh, you know, wor worst case scenario. I mean, just literally the apocalypse happened. That is the the nine hundred and thirty two thousand versus the one million thirty two thousand. So literally, if the world fell apart, our biggest risk is a hundred thousand dollar risk. But what we're betting on, if we did this, is that the spend is you know, if we wanted to be more conservative and we wanted to base our budget off of 60% spend, all the history, and I can't guarantee any numbers because nobody knows until it's all said and done, but as many years as I've been doing this, 50 to, 50 per, 50 to 55% is the expected spend that we normally see. So I would think funding it at 60% or even 65 would be a, a conservative estimate um, that would be approved by, you know, the comptroller because it's not, you're not going on a limb and doing something that other people aren't doing. This is an industry standard of the average of 50 to 55% spend. I think anyone that's dealt with life knows that most of your claims in any kind of insurance are on the low end of the spectrum. They're not at the top. You know, you're, you you've got, many, many more $20,000 claims and you're going to have million dollar claims. And as long as you're covering that lower uh, level well and adequately, you know, uh, the, the big claims are, are few and far between. So that's the way it works. That's why they make you pay so much on the lower end. These are all great questions, by the way. Um, the biggest drawback that I see to this is, you know, what we're talking about right now is until you have experience with it and get comfortable with it, um, you don't know, you know, how much the HRA spend is going to be. The other part is on the employees. You know, they're used to going to the doctor and paying a $25 copay to see the doctor. Or if they have a prescription, they pay a, a $7 generic, you know, for the prescription. This plan is actually, it's, the drawback is that it's different. It is much more straightforward. This plan, the member is going to pay the first $250 at the beginning of the year. 
straight up. So whatever it is, prescription, doctor's visit, whatever, they have a $250 deductible. After that $250 deductible is met, then the HRA is gonna kick in and pay 90% of whatever the cost is. The member is gonna pay 10 until the HRA bucket is, is exhausted. Um, most of the members will never exhaust the entire HRA bucket to your point. The members that do, there's a little bit of out of pocket left on the back end before the medical insurance covers the whole thing. But those are the people that actually win the most because if they max out their claim, you already saw the numbers about how much less out of pocket it would be to those folks. So it is, it's a different way of getting there. People don't like change. That's the big drawback. But if y'all think that we can do a good enough job of educating people and showing them where it is beneficial, then you know, I guess that's the, the, the task of the, of the committee here. Um, in full transparency, we talked about, I always like to, to tell people this, uh, I make less money on these types of plans than if I were selling you the $500 deductible, the um, $1,000 deductible. So, you know, I think it's just human nature to think, all right, well, what's in it for this guy? Um, the HRA, because it's self-insured, there's no commission in that. So the commission, instead of getting paid on 932000 what I get paid on is a percentage of the 625. So when I'm out selling an HRA plan, this is actually the health insurance plan that I make the least amount of money on, but it just makes sense to the member, which is why we, but you know, which is why we pitch it. How many counties around, I mean, in Tennessee, you've got several counties that use this plan. Uh, we do. Um, the uh, Monroe County government uh, has been on a, a HRA plan for years. City of Hohenwald has been on a plan uh, for, for years. City of Winchester. Um, you know, the, the last two are a little bit more uh, of y'all's size. Um, the majority of private plans that you see in the government space that I've run into are actually the, the high deductible plan with the HRA. Wait, city of Waverly, um, last I talked to them, it's quite a few. Uh, we work with Sumner County on their uh, vision and their voluntary benefits, but they have a different, um, they do their health insurance, uh, the consulting in a little different way, but of course their, their size is so large they just pay a set amount for a consultant and he goes out and shops net of commission. So no commission, but he just gets paid a flat rate from, from the county. So we do work with them, but not on their, on their I believe so. I think this is the way everything's headed ultimately. And then now we're full disclosure. Now we're just getting into my opinions. But you know, you look at the rising cost of healthcare. You look at what even the state's done. You know, gradually raising the deductibles, raising the out-of-pocket maximums. This, to me, is 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 where it's going because it simplifies it and it puts some more responsibility back on the member. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think that um, that's the way that everything's heading. Well, I don't know how long it'll take to get there, but that's my my two cents. Other thoughts? I know we started talking about this a long time ago. Um, the, the quote that we originally got was intended for a 7-1 effective date. Um, I, I talked with the Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, representative and he uh, got the underwriters to agree to hold these rates until 9-1. So anything after a September 1st effective date, we would just have to get updated claims experience and go back to the insurance carriers and, 
and basically start the process over again with, um, with updated information. Mayor, what's, you need to do, what action does our committee need to do to, tonight on a far? I believe if you're, if you were gonna do this, we have to let the state know that we're coming off their plan and what would be the deadline for letting the state know? Uh, the deadline for that, it's a 60 day um, termination notice. Um, because it's a mid, excuse me, because it would be a mid year changeover, uh, we would get a report from the state and give the members uh, deductible credit. So for whatever their deductible they've met this year, they would get credit over to the new plan. Um, so basically, uh, I could back into it, but it, the 60 day notice would put you at the end of June. So having to give them July and August, if it was gonna be a, a nine one effective date. Well, that being said, would it be better to start it at the beginning of the calendar year? The, the beginning of the calendar year, uh, if that's what you guys want to do, the absolutely. But because costs are going up on everything, there's something called trend. And, and trend is about 1.5% right now per month. So all things being the same, they would at least add, um, you know, a point or a percentage or to a percentage and a half. Okay, or I understand it would be different than the cost. Uh, I, I get that. But but as far as the ease of making the transition, would it be easier July 1st? Would it be easier January 1st? I guess is my question. Or would it make no difference one way or the other? Um, I, I do think a lot of people connect with doing it at the end of an existing year. Um, but it is also common to, to do it in the middle of the year. I think the key is more about what are you gonna do to educate the employees? You know, if you just roll it out and say, here it is, it doesn't matter what time of the year, it's gonna be a disaster. The, the key is coming out, doing group meetings and then sitting down one-on-one -on -one with every person to explain how it would affect them individually. I did get one question on here. The HRA, as far as that goes, the, the HRA part, that's actually the county's bucket, right? That's not the employee's bucket. So at the end of the year, it'll roll over, but it'll stay in the county's funds. It's not a, an account that's sitting there that the employee has that rolls over. Uh, that's correct. That's the difference in an HRA and an HSA. The HSA is a health savings account. And once you put that money in their account, it's their money. If they leave, they take it with them. The HRA is the exact same thing with the difference of the employer owns the money and it only goes out if it gets used. So at the end of the year, if it's unused, it stays in the, in the county's budget. So we're, we're here at the beginning of the month. You know, my, this may be a, a poor suggestion. Um, Y'all have to tell me about how yeah, your, your meetings work and special call meetings and, and things like that. Um, given the, just given the, how big this decision is, how many numbers are involved in it, um, you know, I, I would definitely seriously consider taking the offer on the table for the nine one. Um, anything past that, like I said, if we do a one, one, you're talking September, October, November, December. So you're talking anywhere from four to 6% that gets added to the figure just because of the thing they call trend. Um, we certainly, you know, can do that, um, and, and requote everything. But I think if you had another five to 6% on top of here, I don't know if the numbers you know, from a budget standpoint, I don't know if the numbers make sense anymore. But I think that y'all need to take the information tonight and look at it. 
it's too much information to hear for the first time and make a decision that affects the entire county, uh, the employees of the county. So my suggestion would be take it, digest it, have, an, have a special call meeting if you need to, to come back together and, and then take a vote on it. It also give you time to talk with some of the employees. If you wanna go out and sample the, the employees to talk about, um, hey, you know, does this plan make sense for you? Um, but that would be my, that'd be my suggestion. And if you want me to remodel this with the zero, the, the limited plan, you know, with, with no cost, um, you know, so that everybody wins uh, in the monthly premium, I can do that or I can leave it at 20. Would you be available in the next few weeks to let the employees maybe come and talk to you and all that before we make a decision? And let, I mean, could you, I mean, that probably sounds like be the thing they need to do. I do know that I'm, um, I'm gonna be out of town the night, the week of the 19th. Um, I have availability. I could even come back next week for a, um, an informational session, you know, where employees come in, they, they hear about the plan. Um, if y'all wanted to get an informational session together, I could do, um, Wednesday or Thursday of, of next week. And then the following week, I'm, I'm out of town. Well, we've got the sheriff and the mayor here. And I mean, they, he's, a lot of his employees, you know, has got the insurance. And I mean, one's up at the, at the administrative building too. I mean, does that sound good to y'all? Yeah, I think that'll be a good, because there's, there's going to be a lot of questions. Uh, just got, I had a guy of questions. I appreciate going through it again. This helped me clarify it a little bit better. But uh, see, I got a lot of questions. And just like if you go through it, and are you going to have two separate cards? Or is it going to be on the one card? And I, I can see a lot of questions like that. Yeah. Um, so I'd be happy to do that. Y'all tell me, you know, go back and look at it. Tell me, you know, if, if Wednesday or Thursday works for an informational uh, session and, um, and I can do that. It's, um, you know, it's not without its, its challenges. You know, sometimes the physicians, you know, they, they need a little coaching on how to, how to file it properly because they're used to doing the copay thing too. Um, so well, once you get them used to that, but if there are any problems, that's the, the service aspect that I was talking about, um, where we've got a, a dedicated team, you know, account managers that y'all just call us, and, you know, we call the doctors, we call the, uh, the pharmacists if there's any misunderstanding at the point of service, and we make sure that it's right at the end. I don't think the budgetary uh, impact, as long as it's the same or close to the same, it's not an issue. But if we're looking at substantially more money, we're going into budget. We're trying to pass a budget now. We're overdue on doing that. And we don't, you know, need another wild card of unknown figures thrown in there. Uh, that was why I was being so inquisitive on the, the budgetary side of it. But if we think we can go with the figures that we have built in the budget or insurance, even if we go with this, then I think that wouldn't be uh, an obstacle, I guess, uh, or a stumbling block. So that was my main motivation for asking those type questions. Um, it looks to me that we can do that. And uh, unless I'm looking at it wrong, I don't think it'll be an issue. But Mayor, am I right in thinking that? What's your uh, thoughts? This, this might be more of an Amy question. I know she's kind of giving me cockeyed, I think. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the total is right I don't ahead, know. So. I guess what one thing I'm asking, obviously we're going to have an increase if we stay where we're at. Did we build that the increase into our budget? Okay. So with that in there, then it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, if you're coming in, and if you go with what they've got, well, they've got the 2023 rate increases, which they're saying, 
ultimately at the end of it, if you put in your savings through the HRA, you're actually going to be spending a little bit less. It's not going to be a tremendous amount, but it's going to be less than what they were projecting under the increase with the what the state's telling us this year. So since it is a little bit less, if we've already budgeted that, it should work out in the end and it shouldn't require anything throughout the year, I wouldn't think. But again. So, so, that, so that make right. So that makes sense. So if we've got that amount budgeted, that is possibly funding it at 60%. Then the question to me comes on time and so like the nine one, right? And, and right now, and I'm, I'm just asking because I'm not uh, an accounting employee, so I don't know. So do you, when does everybody enroll now, normally at the end of the year sure. for the beginning? So you start rolling in October or November and it's going to start. So this would move that then we'd have to move that up because you'd have to, you'd have to get enrolled by what, by when, by nine one? Nine one effective date for these rates. So right. The budget would because if we don't do that, then it is going to change because it's going to go up by 4% from where we're talking about right now. So that it is going to increase the budget from what you've already worked on. But what does that do from year over year then? Does that mean enrollment's always going to change now to September? And then we have to work the county budget against September to September for health care? We can manipulate that date in subsequent years to to reset the renewal on seven one. I mean, that, that is one of the things that going on a private plan gives you the flexibility of doing is getting your plan actually aligned with the fiscal year so that you're not having to budget you know blindly a half a year and at a time. So um, we could get it aligned um, on a on a seven one afterward. But uh, yeah, I, again, I understand there's a lot of moving pieces here. If, if we if we want to do it nine one, after talking with the employees, I think that that is doable. If we want to wait till uh, January one and you know get updated claims experience and and go back to to blue and just you know do it on a plain year, but we can uh, we can do that, uh, or um, we can even uh, just push the whole thing until seven one of twenty twenty three and just come right out of the gate uh, on the fiscal year at 7-1-2023, um, assuming that I can go out, you know, and the numbers support getting, you know, quotes that are competitive against the state again. Wish I could tell y'all what to do. Well, so, I, I like the idea of shooting for 9-1, if we can make it happen, if we have time to get with the employees and seem like they're happy with it and have buy-in on it, and uh, we don't have some large scale revolt. Uh, certainly, I think it's doable. Um, I, I think we can shoot for that. And if we can't see that we can't, then we'll just have to back up and punt. I mean, it seems like for a lot of employees, they would save, they could save a lot of money. And then the $20, I, I agree, right? You get, you need to, you know, put a little put a little skin in the game to decide if you need it. Do you need the insurance or not? Because there's some people that's probably on it that really don't even use need it or use it, and there's no sense in us having a budget for that. So that's my thoughts. You say next Wednesday or Thursday would be you would be available? Yes, sir. Mayor or sheriff. Do y'all think what would be the best date? Right now, I would shoot for Wednesday. And I can do more than one session, uh, but I would highly encourage as, as many people to participate as, as humanly possible. That way you guys can get a good swath of reactions and, and feedback from, from the employees. Can can Mayor and the Sheriff, can y'all get the word to most of you employees or what do we need to do to try to get the, all the word out? Yeah, I think we can. And then as far as the time, we'll sit, probably look at doing it at the community center. And well, it's either the community center or here, it's one or the other. So we have to see if it's available. 
Uh, oh yeah, I'll I'll change this up. This the the other presentation will be geared towards them and how they are affected. It won't have all this budget stuff in there. I think if there's a lot of questions that it. Yeah, uh, if whatever y'all need me to do, I mean, y'all know the employees the best, so y'all just tell me, and I'll, I'll accommodate whatever y'all thinks best. We could record it too. Put, you know. For those who couldn't make a, a meeting, you know, they could go listen to it, the, the Facebook thing. Does our committee need to make a motion to do this or what? I guess if we are going to do this changeover on September 1st, we've got to let the state know by July 1st. So, I mean, I know it's very, very short and you just got this presentation tonight. So I don't, I don't know if you're really ready to make a movement on it now, but there is the, the benefit of doing on nine one, you get the savings instead of it going up on January 1st, but the, the state side of the things is where the time crunch comes in because you have to give them 60 days notice. Are y'all allowed to, are y'all allowed to do a special called meeting at the, at the end to meet the deadline? Well, probably, I mean, yes. I mean, the, the problem with a special call meeting is of the commission is the cost. A committee a committee has its call whenever the chairman wants to meet. We just have to have enough notice to, notice of a meeting, you know, public notice. Other than that, but as far as the committee, committee can meet again next week or two weeks or a month. I mean, it's not really bound like the commission. Um, there's a big cost difference in calling a committee meeting and a commission meeting, <clears throat> I guess is what I'm trying to say. Not a few dollars, a few thousand dollars. So that's why you wouldn't want to necessarily have a call meeting of the commission if you didn't have to. But if you did, you did. When is this month's, when is this month's uh, full commission scheduled meeting? Fourth Monday night of every month. Oh, well. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the night of the 27th. So if we did, if we did an informational session on the 15th and got as many people to come as we could, we recorded it, got it on Facebook, and then, you know, solicited feedback from the employees to, to get their take on it. And that would, uh, y'all could reconvene the, the insurance commission, um, you know, sometime the, um, you know, the week of the 20th. Um, I'll be back on Friday, the 24th. Uh, I'll be back in town on the 23rd, but. Uh, The informational meeting as the committee meeting as well and just at the end of it you know kind of after you've gotten feedback if you wanted to you could uh, make the committee's recommendation at that point uh, I, I assume it's going to have to go to the full commission for a vote on it uh, and certainly we could get that I think handled uh, it's going to be tight, you know, it's not a lot of room for a lot of what ifs, but uh, I think it's still doable.
I think from what I'm reading without, the, I know there's been some people that are not here tonight that are on this committee that I'm sure are following or will look at this later to, to give us, you know, their thoughts as well as their input. But I think the consensus of what I see and hear tonight, and you correct me, Mr. Chairman, if I'm wrong, that we want to move forward with it uh, to at least the stage of talking to the employees about it. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, you all can, I mean, if, if that's the direction you want to go, you're, if that's something you want to recommend, I certainly week, so we can work on that. If that's what direction you want to go. I mean, I would like their, the employees' feedback. I mean, that's who's, I mean, yeah, it's, who's this going to affect? Because it's a net effect to the county one way or the other. It's going to save us a little money in the long run, possibly. But the reason for doing this is to give them better benefits. And, uh, but they've got to realize that that's what we're trying to do and that they are going to get those benefits. And change is hard. And people, find every uh, thing in the, the book to uh, resist it sometimes, but uh, I, I'm certainly uh, feel like we need to try to get it to them and see what they have to say. What about our local doctors and will they be in network with us and Great question. The, the network that we're looking at here is Blue Cross and Blue Shield S, which is the same uh, network that the state health plan uses, or one of them. Um, so uh, anytime you make a change and you go from, you know, the state has Blue Cross and it has Cigna, you know, people get to choose their network. Mm -hmm. um, but in the state of Tennessee, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield S network is as strong as any um, of the base networks that's out there. So uh, will every single doctor be in it? Might there be a little bit of network disruption? There always is, but the majority of doctors are on the Blue Cross and Blue Shield S. Okay. And if it does come down to it, doing the enrollments and everything, is that something five points is going to do versus kind of right now our my HR assistant has the one to work on it, but I think under what we are doing with our agreement with eight, five points, I think you all would be coming in and helping with the enrollment. Am I correct on that? Uh, that's correct. You know, we're, we're having the medical discussion first. Um, there's other benefits that uh, are paid for by the employee. Those are the supplemental benefits. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, company one, two, three, and four, they're all basically the same. So we, um, We've got dental and vision plans that we talked about in the original meeting that, um, that are, you know, better network, better coverage, um, you know, more advantageous for the employee that are comparably priced, maybe a couple of dollars more, but they're going to get a lot more out in benefit. So what we do is we wrap the rest of that enrollment in with the medical insurance enrollment so that every single person sits down with one representative and does a one-stop shop. They enroll uh, in all their plans and they've got the assistance of somebody in person um, every single year to do it. That, that's great, that's nice. A lot better than a lot of employers offer today. So we going y'all gonna try to get a meeting scheduled for Yeah, we'll we'll work to get it scheduled with uh, Mr. Dozier and look see what facility it'd be the best to do it in. We'll get it scheduled, work with employees. And I I'm gonna suggest probably do at least two different sessions so people can come in when it's best for their schedule. Cause you know, like you said, sheriff's department, you got shift change, other things like that. So that's what we've done in the past for different trainings and that kind of stuff. You do different times, and so that's what we'll work on doing this time. So after y'all do that meeting and with the employees, we can schedule an insurance meeting soon after if it seems like it 
something we do want to do with the FAS employees is wanting to do. I mean, we can try to schedule an insurance meeting. Yeah, I would, um, if possible, doing a, um, because of the shift change, having worked with a lot of sheriff's departments over the years, you know, catching the second meeting about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes right after the, the, the change or right at six, you know, and you telling your guys, hey, you know, again, if it works for you, that way you can get those coming off, those coming on, you knock them all out at one meeting. So a five o'clock to get the people getting off of work and then a six o'clock right on its heels to get the, the shift change of the sheriff and then a, a you know, meeting with y'all at seven, seven fifteen. So once that's set up, can can y'all make sure we know? You send an email out to the committee so we know, right? So y'all gonna try to meet on the with the employees on the fifteenth? Yeah, uh, given the time he's got available, uh, probably the fifteenth is what I'm gonna shoot for. A meeting at five and a meeting at six. So y'all gonna get the word out to the employees? Then we do have an insurance meeting after that that night, or the next night or two after that, or the next. Well, the next night is the candidate forum up here at the Grace Baptist Church. So I, I won't be available. So I don't know if you all, if you're running for election, if you're planning on attending that or not. I mean. I'm going to go to that because they're going to have food. <laughs> yeah, just go ahead and set it for that. And if we need to change it, we can. Uh, I'm getting back on the 23rd, but I can have, uh, I could have one of our team members, you know, come in my place. You know, by that point, y'all will, you know, heard it tonight. You'll, you know, be at one of the informational meetings, you know, again. Um, so I think if y'all met on the 23rd, uh, just to make sure that, that'll give you more time too, to talk with the employees, right? They need some time to digest it too. So. The 23rd, um, and even if I'm not here, I think that y'all, um, it might actually even be beneficial if I'm not here. I mean, I am the sales guy that's trying to sell it. I get that, but I hope y'all can also catch that I'm, I'm not trying to, to twist your arm. You know, this is y'all's decision. Um, you know, my job was to go out and find something that, you know, we think could make it work, and, and I think that it can. Um, so even on the 23rd, if I'm not here, that'll just give y'all complete you know, nobody influencing you. Y'all talk about what your employee said and then y'all just make the make the call on whether or not it's something that you want to move forward with. And if you don't, that doesn't, again, that doesn't stop us from looking at it again. You know, if 9-1 if doesn't work and we need to look at 1-1, one, one, great. If that doesn't work and we need to look at 7-1 to get it on a fiscal year, then, then I'm good with that too. I mean, this is, y'all are in control. Well, you have some sort of a, a handout to give to the employees that, not like you said, not as detailed as this is, particularly with all the numbers, but as far as uh, giving them the comparison between what they have now uh, and how and where they're gonna see the savings on their out of pocket and things, even if it's just a one sheet pass out or. Absolutely, I'll, yeah. I'll have a, a PowerPoint, you know, that I can put up on the screen. Sure. But then I can also have a, uh, a plan summary, which one of these slides in here, basically, what are the plans, you know, that are available today, you know, next to this one? And it can be a front and back, um, you know, where it's got the plan summary comparison and then the rate comparison. I think it would be helpful and I think they would appreciate having something in their hand to walk out with to look at. Uh, uh, I think it would be behoove us to try to make that happen. And I'm good with it. Let's move forward with it.
So y'all try to get the meeting lined up the 15th. We'll go ahead and schedule a insurance meeting for the 23rd. That is that what my understanding? Yeah, we'll work on it on the 15th and then that gives employees time to look at it a little bit more of what they were told, then come back for this committee on the 23rd. Yes, I mean, if we get the 23rd meeting, our committee can recommend to the whole commission for the that Monday, the following Monday night meeting, if, if we decide if we want to go forward with this. That's... Is there any more discussion on this? I appreciate you coming. This, uh... Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You can go ahead and announce. It's a great presentation, and I think, I mean, it looks, I mean, I think it's something the employees may be very interested in. Uh, we'll move on. Is that all you've got? Yes, sir. That's all I've got. We move on to number four. Is any other discussion needs to be brought up tonight? I, I, I'm kidding. Let me get to my next presentation. I'm, I'm kidding. Thank y'all. Is there any more discussion? Any other discussion need to be brought up tonight? We move on to number five, public comments. Anybody in the public got any comments? That's all I've got. I hear a motion to adjourn. I would like to make the motion to adjourn. I never motion get to do it. Motion to second by Mr. <laughs> Davis. Appreciate y'all coming and thank you again with.